Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on security and safety, strategies for a challenging time. Reeling from attacks on Jews and Jewish institutions in 2018 and 2019, and now facing the impact of COVID-19, leading Jewish organizations and Jewish communities throughout the United States are developing new and innovative approaches to community security. In this session, funders will learn about work that's being done to secure Jewish institutions and virtual communities. And now I am pleased to introduce our moderators, moderator for today's program, Carly Mizell, Global CEO of the Kirsch Foundation and board member of CSI and CSS to frame the conversation further and introduce her fellow panelists. Thank you, Carly. Thank you very much, Tamar. And it's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm gonna start off by introducing um, the panelists we've got with us. Um, so Michael Masters is the National Director and CEO of the Secure Community Network, the official safety and security organization of the Jewish Federations of North America and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Previously, Masters served as the senior VP of the Sufin Group, a strategic international consultancy firm, and as the CEO of CivicScape, an advanced predictive analyst company. Masters served as the Executive Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Cook County, Illinois, and as the Chief of Staff for the Chicago Police Department. Masters received a commission in the US Marine Corps attaining the rank of Captain. Certified as a Peace Officer and SWAT Operator, Masters continues to serve as a part-time police officer. Mitch Silver was named the Executive Director of the Community Security Initiative in January 2020 a new position created as part of UJA and JCRC New York's $4 million plan to help secure local Jewish institutions in the New York region. Before accepting this position, Silver spent more than two years working directly for Ronald Lauder, conducting security and threat assessments of diaspora Jewish communities throughout Europe. And he worked alongside former NYPD police commissioner, Raymond Kelly at Guardian Group. Mr. Silver served as the Director of Intelligence Analyst at the New York Police Department, where he was the Principal Advisor to the Deputy Commissioner of Intelligence on Counterterrorism Policy Analysis. Evan Bernstein is the new CEO of the Community Security Service. He came to CSS from the ADL, where he was the Vice President Northeast Division and sat on the Senior Management Team. Evan has fostered close relationships with both New York and national law enforcement, and has been a leader in responding to numerous acts of anti-Semitism across the United States. So we've got three real experts here today, and therefore I'm very keen to, to turn the floor over to you. Um, as Tamar mentioned, I'm very privileged to sit on the boards of both CSI and CSS, and to count Michael Masters as a friend. So it was uh, with great pleasure that I accepted JFN's request to moderate today. Um, as you can probably all hear, I'm not a, an American native, and I've always been very involved in uh, Jewish security for the British Jewish community. And when I moved to America, um, I was both surprised and heartened to learn that the same security infrastructure that we have in Europe wasn't necessary. Unfortunately, in the last two years, that has had to change. So violent attacks targeting the Jewish community over the last two years have been something you will all be familiar with from the tragedy witnessed in Pitt, Pittsburgh, Holway, Jersey City, and Monzi. The FBI says that 58% of religious hate crimes is targeted at the Jewish community, and that's the highest in decades. So I wanted to start with you, Michael, so you could tell the group a little bit of the national picture um, and how you see um, anti-Semitism and Jewish security as we go into the high holidays. Sure, thank you so much. It's uh... Pleasure to be here and to join uh, both colleagues and friends, uh, Mitch, as well as Evan, and Carly, you as well, and for your moderation. And I just want to thank uh, JFN and wish all of the uh, folks who are watching the webinar a Shana Tova in advance, since we usually get time crunched at the end, or hopefully will be. I think, you know, as, as you framed it, Carly, we have seen the uh, rise of hate crimes across the country, as well as in local locations like New York City. Um, Following the attack in Pittsburgh in 2018, we, we often heard, was, was this a call to action? And the reality is, is that the American Jewish community uh, for decades had been answering that call in federations and national partner organizations around the country. 
uh, but we did see an increase uh, in activity amongst the Jewish community to address security and safety in a more holistic manner. And I think the, the partnership that is developing and that is in process between UJA and the JCRC, CSS and SCN is an indicator of that. And it's really critical, particularly right now to get to your question, because while the pandemic has changed so much in our lives, uh, disrupting our interactions and forcing us to close so many of our facilities, it has not, as we are always quick to point out, stopped those who hate us. Uh, SCN serves as the official liaison with federal law enforcement. We continually work with the FBI and DHS to assess the threat condition facing our community. Prior to the pandemic, we noted that we were facing the most complex and dynamic threat environment facing the country and the Jewish community specifically than any time in our nation's history. And that results from the different threat actors from Islamist extremists to uh, violent far right extremists, neo-Nazis and white supremacists as well as the threat vectors, everything from physical attacks, as you noted, to cyber attacks. It's important to recognize that since that October 2018 attack in Pittsburgh, the FBI has arrested over two dozen individuals plotting attacks on Jewish institutions in the United States. And they have disrupted many more through the active involvement of our Jewish community. And it speaks to why programs like Mitch's, uh, Evans, and SCN's are so critical to the community. Since the beginning of this year, the FBI has arrested near record levels of domestic terrorism suspects. The FBI director testified that they have over a thousand active investigations going on this year, which is 150 more than they testified to last year, and they're occurring in all 50 states. Now, what we have seen in the transition of that terror, while we face threats from all sides, we have seen a marked increase uh, from the far right, white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Those attacks have occurred over the past six years in 42 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. Since 9-11, white supremacists and other far-right extremists have been responsible for almost three times as many attacks on U.S. soil as Islamic extremists. And it is what caused in our current threat assessments, if you look at the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, they mark that threat from white supremacists and neo-Nazis as the highest uh, in, in their area of operation. And we're seeing that across the country. Uh, and this pretends particularly difficult for our Jewish community because we know that our Jewish community is targeted. Uh, in a press release earlier today, Mitch, Mitch and Evan noted the National Counterterrorism Report, which identified specifically threats against our Jewish community. That means that as our facilities reopen, we need to be even more focused on safety and security and how we need to come together as organizations and as a community to address it. Thank you, Michael. So Mitch, according to the NYPD, more than half of the hate crimes committed in New York C City in 2019 were against Jews. And in 2019, New York City experienced the most amount of hate crimes since 1992. So what do you credit this disturbing trend to? Well, thanks, Carly, and, and thanks for having me on this panel on this important topic. Uh, the good news is that in 2020, those numbers have all fallen by 50%. But we all realized that we're in a rarefied atmosphere, unlike a normal situation. So what, what are the reasons behind the significant climb in anti-Semitic incidents in New York City? Well, if you were to ask the commanding officer of the hate crimes unit at NYPD, his response would be, well, it, it's all social media. Um, and I think that's a part of it, but in some ways that's a little bit of a simplistic, maybe too simplistic of an answer. Um, you know, we think about some of the different trends that are washing over the country and New York as well, you know, conspiracy theories, certainly on social media, you know, on Facebook, in the deep and dark web, have resonance like they never have before. Um, and, and what is true is really something that gets debated more often than ever before. Also, we're in an environment that is still to some degree recovering from the 2008-2009 uh, economic decline. And there is a feeling of anti-economic elites. Um, and then you've got uh, this anti-immigrant feeling in certain parts of the country. So if you put all those things together, um, you certainly have an environment that's not favorable to the Jewish population in the sense that we're often linked in with economic elites 
we're being seen as pro-immigration because of our own historic trends in the United States. And certainly Jews throughout history have always fallen victim to conspiracy theories. Uh, in New York City, a lot of the anti-Semitism that we were seeing in 2019 was not necessarily of an ideological variant, not far right, not Islamist, but what I like to call community or street anti-Semitism. Much of it happening on the streets in Brooklyn um, by communities that were just very different. And maybe a perception that, you know, a community different, maybe doing well economically and maybe vulnerable. So it's tough to really put our finger on what were all of the causes for this. Uh, some of the arrests were not necessarily insightful in terms of what motivated these people, but there are a variety of different trend lines out there that at least may point us somewhat in the direction. Thank you. And, and I should tell the audience they should feel free to post questions in the Q&A throughout and I'll, uh, I'll weave them in. So Evan, you know, you, you were recently um, at ADL and you've, you've just started at CSS. And if you could take both of those experiences and, and tell the group a little bit more about how you think COVID has affected the spread of anti-Semitism. And then um, Michael and, and Mitch, I will come to you to see if there's anything you'd like to add related to COVID. Thanks, Carly. And again, uh, thank you, uh, Jewish Funders Network, and, uh, for having us. And it's great to be on with, uh, with two friends and colleagues of Michael and Mitch, and, and clearly you, Carly, as well. Uh, I think, you know, COVID was, was a unique thing for, for anti-Semitism. Uh, I was still at the ADL when, when COVID hit, and we saw, uh, as Mitch talked about, conspiracy theories uh, around Jews spreading the virus, that the virus came out of Israel. Uh, it led to a tremendous amount of anti-Semitic rhetoric online that is, again, it's, it's impossible sometimes to put a clear line to the acts of anti-Semitism that would take place on the street, but it certainly was, was, was taking over hearts and minds because you saw the comments, we saw uh, the explosion of, of rhetoric that would come off of certain people's tweets. People would had, you know, tens of thousands of followers are putting these things out. It wasn't just, you know, bots with uh, five or six followers. We saw some significant uh, conspiracy theory that wasn't even just towards the Jewish community, it was also towards the Asian community. I, I drafted some, some letters with leaders in the Asian community as well. There was there's other minority groups that were affected by COVID, but we certainly saw it, uh, you know, pushing anti-Semitism and pushing those uh, anti-Semitic tropes around the conspiracy theory that Jews are the ones that are passing uh, the disease. I think what, what, what really also took place, what I saw was after we, we had this moment in Jersey City, uh, in, in Brooklyn also in December, uh, with the spate of attacks, and then, you know, bookended with what took place in Muncie, uh, it was a moment where anti-Semitism was really on the forefront of, uh, you know, nationally. Uh, and we had 25 plus thousand people walking over the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, I think what happened with COVID is it somehow stripped away that progress that we were making as far as having real context around the rise of anti-Semitism and then led right into COVID with, with this, these theories that took hold. And, and now you know, even over COVID, a continuation, unfortunately, of even you know, anti-Semitic attacks and other uh, anti-Semitic uh, swastika in incidents and, and hate crimes that are taking place even here in the New York uh, area and also, you know, that are taking place nationally. So, um, you know, it's disturbing that I think a lot of progress that was made has been eroded and, and these trends at a time where, where you would hope that things would be lessened, we're still seeing uh, these acts of hate and, and rhetoric towards Jews. Thank you. Michael, is there anything you'd like to add? I think I would just um, point out on the on the operational side what what this has meant for our Jewish institutions. Uh, the, the COVID environment combined with the anti-Semitism, uh, we, we saw this move to, to shut organizations down. Um, and I, I think it is a, a testament to our community institutions that they didn't really know how to do that uh, and, and do so in a secure and safe way. They've been open uh, continuously. And then we saw a shift almost immediately to, as Evan indicated, uh, the cyber side of the house, an increase in phishing scams, an increase in fraud scams, um, certainly targeting of our, what I consider still our sacred space, but cyberspace. Um, we, we just took a report yesterday, our duty desk from Temple Emanuel of Dothan, Alabama. It is the only Jewish institution located within 90 miles that was the victim of a severe Zoom bombing. And so we're seeing this across the country and across the landscape. And now as we move into the high holidays, 
thinking through how do we how do we secure those online spaces? We estimate from uh, our our coordination with the USCJ and URJ that about 80 to 90 percent of reform and conservative services will happen online, while uh, almost in in the exact opposite uh, in the Orthodox community, how do we hold open uh, in-person services in a, in a socially distant or outdoor space safely and securely. It's presenting some real challenges that um, we are working, obviously, all of us closely with law enforcement as well as other partners to, to try to address. Um, and to you, Mitch? Yeah, I would just, you know, when I put my intelligence analyst hat on, and I look at the situation and, and from conversations with federal law enforcement, you know, the pandemic has activated Jew hatred. And the federal government believes that domestic violent extremists are likely to continue to exploit the pandemic to either incite or engage in violence. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, that means that there are conspiracy theories, as Evan mentioned, that, you know, Jews started the virus, spread the virus, that Jews actually are the virus. Some of the memes that are spread in the dark and deep web are important to pay attention to because they give you some insight into what these extremists are saying. And, you know, one of the ones that's most alarming to me is one that says, if you, if you have the bug, give a hug. Um, and it's uh, the idea is that to spread the coronavirus to Jews. And, you know, we may sort of take this as just propaganda online, but unfortunately, these are the types of things that are mobilizing violent extremists into action. And it just makes me concerned that as we do begin to reopen up our institutions, we're prepared for this additional threat. And I think that's why uh, you hear from Michael and Evan and myself this sense of concern, you know, even as we take a few steps uh, out of quarantine. Carly, can I add one other? Okay, you can you can have one more minute. Um, <laughs> I just I wanted to reference something uh, to to Mitch's answer on on the hate crimes, uh, which I I thought was was great regarding um, what we're seeing. You now I, I just want to point out from the national perspective, as that fifty eight percent number that you referenced. You know, this only, that only tells part of the story. We have over 80% of law enforcement agencies nationally that report no hate crimes to include 70 cities of populations of over 100,000 or more, which uh, my, my colleague, our colleague at the ADL, George Salim, is always quick to point out. Now, unless we all believe that there are really no hate crimes reporting uh, occurring across the country, that means we have a real reporting issue. Um, one estimate says over 250,000 victims of hate crimes a year, the ma vast majority of which are going unreported. And I, I think that one of the things that we need to think about is how we make sure every Jewish community and institution across the U.S. Uh, is supported. One of the things with the increase that we see in certain communities is an increase in reporting, which is good. Um, and certainly I think we need to emphasize that and it's a collective responsibility to make sure that we are pushing across all of our communities, urban and rural, to make sure that they're protected, they're secure, and that they have a viable means of reporting and addressing that hate that occurs. Well, fortuitously, you've led into my next question. So your, uh, your introduction, interaction was allowed. allowed. So um, now that we started to discuss the threat, I wanted to look at, at to be a little more practical. So um, in light of what you have all described, what safety measures should synagogues, Jewish schools, and JCCs um, actually be taking as we run up to the high holidays. Um, Mitch, I wanted to start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, with that in mind, here in New York, uh, we've conducted a series of webinars. And those webinars have addressed sort of three different vectors of the threat. Uh, one that we hosted was focused on health security. And we had the Commissioner of Public Health from New York State, Dr. Zucker, participate in this webinar to give guidance to those institutions that are actually going to be holding in-person uh, services, indoors or outdoors. Uh, as part of that, we took on a second element of the threat that we're concerned about, and that is what liabilities do you open yourself up to to having outdoor services? Surely a tent sounds great, but obviously our concern, uh, having seen some of the messaging from ISIS, and from violent extremists on the right, 
you know, looking to use vehicles for ramming to make sure that those institutions are prepared and coordinating with local authorities so that barriers are in place to protect those outdoor services, uh, as well as taking other measures to make sure that outdoor services are well protected. And then the third element is for those institutions who are only having an online service. And obviously we've all heard about the incidents of Zoom bombing um, that have taken place since the pandemic. And Zoom has fortunately put some uh, safeguards in place. And for that third webinar, we actually partnered with Evan's old organization, the uh, Anti-Defamation League, to have uh, one of their experts come on board and explain to our institutions, you know, how can you best uh, protect your online services from being Zoom bombed? So those are some of the things that we've done here in the New York area for our institutions. Thank you. And Evan, how would you advise people at this stage? Well, I think, you know, what we've been doing with our, our volunteers around the country has been trying to get them uh, answers to their questions. And we've been able to do that through resources from, you know, two organizations on this, on this call. One, you know, we've been, you know, circulating and, and using a lot of the reference tools that SCAN has been, has been sending out, especially, um, you know, on, on certain best practices, we, we try to share that as much as we can. And also we just had a webinar about a week ago with Mitch, with all of our regional managers and team leaders from around the country. And they were able to take questions and, and learn from uh, what CSI is doing. So I think utilizing uh, our community partners uh, with, with information sharing has been really critical for our volunteers, but also uh, ensuring that our volunteers as they, it's been hard for them because the, the traditional cadence of going to shul and, and everything else has been so disrupted for them. And, and it's kind of a new world for volunteers that are trying to do safety and security. We're trying to update them and get them to have, uh, uh, you know, almost continuing edit, if you will, uh, especially before the Hagim. So they feel up to date on what their training was maybe a year or so ago that we want to make sure they feel comfortable, not only with, with the differences now of meeting outside or having smaller numbers in their shul and, and getting some of that macro information that's critical from CSI and SCAN, but also making sure that we're working with them uh, on the micro level, that, that they're comfortable uh, as those volunteers on the ground and, and they feel like they're getting the resources they need internally from us nationally as our as CSS staff, but also again uh, from those partners. But it's a different time right now and I think people have to be uh, more and more, more diligent than ever before and think out of the box and think differently. And it's not just business as usual. And I think we have to ensure that we're giving our people, uh, you know, the, the, what they need and making sure they're taking it seriously. So before I turn to Michael, Evan, you've touched on the, the word volunteers probably about 10 times in the last three minutes. And that's a slightly different model than probably some people on the phone are used to. So if you could just explain what you mean by a CSS volunteer, um, and how that fits in with, with some of the other traditional security infrastructure. So, you know, as you know, Carly, coming from, uh, from working in CST in the, U in the UK, Europe, you know, for over 50 years is, has been very volunteer driven in their Jewish communities. And they've had uh, security that's been driven by volunteers in, in those given countries where there's Jewish populations. And it's, it's been part of their, their, their culture. It's in their DNA now for, again, over five decades. It's not so much been the case here in the United States uh, post-Holocaust. We've relied a lot on private security and, and law enforcement. Uh, CSS was founded in 2007 to help activate uh, and empower Jewish members of the community to help secure uh, and bring safety programs to their, uh, to their synagogues to mimic what was going on already in Australia, in South Africa, in Europe, and other parts of the, uh, the Jewish communities around the globe. And it's about ensuring that these, these volunteers are trained uh, in their security and safety programs, but also that they're working closely with law enforcement and other, uh, other institutions like Scanner CSI in, in, in cadence with one another. So there is not, you know, everyone's kind of off doing their own thing. I think, you know, for us, the training pro protocols that we're putting in place, and now we're going through a CSS 2.0 with my coming on as a CEO to revamp and even professionalize already uh, solid trainings. We have amazing volunteers. I know some of them are on this phone that de dedicate, you know, hours, you know, 30, 40 hours a week with full-time jobs, raising their children, having families, yet they are dedicated to protecting their institutions uh, or events that are taking place in their community. And I think it's, it's really unique. It's unique to America and we need to revamp it, but it needs to be in a way that's, that's smart and that we are, uh, you know, again, training people at the highest level possible and then also working 
with our, our community partners in the right way. Thank you. Um, Michael, in addition to answering my question, if you could also comment a little bit on what you see as the balance of responsibility for security between federal, state, local government and private philanthropy. You know, as citizens of the US, what should the Jewish community actually expect or should they demand? Um, great, great question. Uh, do you want me to start with the volunteer and then lead into that piece? Sure. Sure, okay. Just want to make sure I'm following directions. It's the Marine in me or, you know, the Jewish son. Um, so, for, you know, one of the things that Evan, Evan said um, struck me particularly because I was thinking SCN was formed in 2003 and 2004, and it was really created not so long ago at the request of federal law enforcement to have a, a team of professional law enforcement and security personnel to work on behalf of the community. And it was only you know, several years after that that CSS was formed here in the US to serve on sort of the flip side to have a volunteer component. Um, some of the first visits that, that SCN at the time did was to the UK to, to visit with the CST. Um, and so I think Evan's completely right. For decades, we relied on this mix of sort of outsourcing to private security. And almost in this relatively short period of time, there was recognized the duality of a requirement of law enforcement security professionals, as well as how do we identify or how do we provide a venue for volunteers, individuals who are committed to the community to have an outlet to, to serve that purpose. Um, and I think that there is a compliment there that um, now that with, with Evan and his role and the relationship that we are developing, we are figuring out what that, that can look like so that we are complementing uh, one another and working for the best interests of safety and security across the Jewish community, both in local communities, as Mitch and, and Evan are doing, as well as more broadly. And I think that's, that's prudent and smart, and it goes exactly into uh, your, your second question, Carly, which is the balance. Um, we have a, a very unique relationship as a community with law enforcement. Part of that is we've worked on the national level, and um, SCN has been recognized as a best practice by DHS largely because we've served as a model for other faith-based communities. One of the distinguishing characteristics though is that we have this collective system. We have a collective system of federations, of national organizations through the conference, and of funders, which is different than a lot of other communities and other faith-based communities specifically. Um, and we have leveraged that really effectively and in meaningful ways to coordinate with law enforcement. So we have this liaison role that, that our duty desk is doing nationally, our, our team is doing nationally with the FBI and DHS. Mitch is doing it uh, with the FBI and local and state law enforcement in the New York area and the catchment area of UJA and JCRC. And we have security programs across the country that are doing that very, very effectively. Um, and we know that law enforcement is gonna be responsive. I mean, one of the things amidst all the other debates that we have today about law enforcement and the role in the community is we have a strong relationship that we need to leverage and we continue to do so, whether it's for the high holidays uh, or it's for everyday security. But we also recognize that the threat is such that we need to be proactive. Um, I mean, even when we look at the tragedy that happened in Pittsburgh, uh, there was a lot of work that went into the preparedness there. The Jewish Federation created a Jewish community security program they recruited a 28-year veteran of the FBI who on his own did over 50 threat assessments of facilities, who trained over 6,000 members of the Jewish community to include, as many of the folks on this webinar are aware, training at the Tree of Life, Dor Hadash, or Lasimcha building less than eight weeks before the attack. And in that training, talked to Rabbi Myers, got him to carry his cell phone using the concept of Pekuach Nefesh. Rabbi Myers was the first 911 call that was made to the Pittsburgh Police Department. He cleared emergency exits that were used by people to save, to save their lives that day, and he provided active threat training that survivors credit with saving their lives. And all of that happened before law enforcement could get there. The benefit of the relationship was that law enforcement knew where they were going and knew what to do once they got there because they'd been through the building with the security director and the congregation. So it's a very symbiotic relationship, but I want to be clear that we have a lot of front work to do on our side to make sure our community is protected and secured. And that's where organizations 
where we can come together between organizations like ADL and CSS and SCN and uh, federation uh, programs like CSI to really ensure we build a security shield over this Jewish community. Thank you. So I want to push a little further on that one, but don't worry, Michael, you're out of the hot seat for the time being. So Mitch, in the UK, it's, it's much more systematic with regards to, to law enforcement. You know, there's a tried and tested model for the High Holy Days. You know, you, they have a, a, a representative in the CST control room and vice versa. You know, the bollards go up. There doesn't have to be a kind of lobbying effort or a, you know, would you, would you help us out this year kind of piece? And um, it's not paid for by the community. It's part of the responsibility of the British government, effectively. So how far away do you think we are from, from getting to that system in New York, whereby, you know, a bit like there's street parking rules or automatic barriers, that some of these things just become a habit for law enforcement around High Holy Days? Sure, you know, it's a great point. And the Community Security Trust in the UK is, by my mind, the gold standard for Jewish security around the world. Uh, and I sat, I've sat in that control room in London and seen their operations. So I think, you know, in taking this position in early 2020, uh, one of my goals was really to try and replicate everything that CST does so well bring that here to New York, to the United States as best practice, as the model that we want to emulate. Um, so I think there are a number of different components that make that program work so well. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, as mentioned a little bit earlier today, is sort of the fusion between um, the more formalized security architecture and volunteers. And today, uh, the Community Security Initiative, our organization, the Evans organization, the Community Security Service have announced an MOU. They really codifies the operational partnership between volunteers and full-time employees focusing on Jewish security uh, in the area. And you know, having volunteers who know the ins and outs of their institutions, who know what's normal, uh, as people might approach their institution who can do, be another layer of security is a key element of that. So one element is volunteers. Another element is partnership with government. Uh, since we've been up and running at the Community Security Initiative, we've been meeting with local elected officials, whether that's the New York City Council or county execs in Westchester, or Nassau and Suffolk, or the DA's office in Queens and Brooklyn and others, we're making sure that local elected officials know what our initiative is and that they are behind it. And I happened to glance over at the chat and saw someone asked about how can you get police to be more involved? Well, part of it is having that outreach to the elected officials that they know what you're doing and that they know this is a high priority for the community. What follows right after that is the partnership with law enforcement. And you heard Carly mention that in the CST control room in London, you have members of Scotland Yard of the Met London Metropolitan Police sitting there in the CST control room, big events are going on. So you really have that fusion between law enforcement and trust uh, and the Jewish security organizations. We too have been trying to follow that model, meeting with Commissioner Shea, meeting in Westchester and Nassau and Suffolk with the, commute, with the county police departments, as well as the patrol borough and even the precinct level here in New York City. So I think those are some of the you know, elements of it. Um, volunteers, uh, full-time employees who consider this their mission, which is CSI, local elected officials, um, police, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention community support and community funding. Uh, the CST, both from the charity, that money that it raises, as well as from governmental funds, is very well resourced. And we've been lucky here at Community Security Initiative to have the backing of the UJA Federation and the JCRC of New York, who have really support our efforts to stand up this initiative. So those are how, the, how I would look at what we're trying to build here with CST as sort of our model in mind. So there's a few tongue, to, tongue twisters here with CSS, SCAN, CSI. Um, you, uh, you've just about managed to use different letters. Um, so I have to be in all of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so for our audience, I was hoping, and Evan, I'll start with you, and, and maybe, to be honest, we won't need to do all three, but we'll see how we go. 
Um, how do the three organizations work together? You know, Mitch has mentioned you guys have just signed an MOU. I know that you have been working with Michael Masters closely since you started, you know, to look at, at forming partnerships there for, for you, you both across, across the US. Um, but if you could just give us a, a, quick, a quick breakdown of all of these C's and S's and I's. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I started uh, just a, about four months ago, so I'm still trying to figure out the alphabet soup, but it's, uh, you know, I think each, each organization for us as a, as a volunteer driven organization uh, is critical. And I think, you know, with, with Mitch, who I talk almost daily with and with Michael, either talk or text <laughs> almost daily with, I think there's, there's tremendous value add that we can extract from these organizations that help us on the ground with our volunteers. Uh, that adds to the work that we're already doing and, and the trainings that we're already doing. So when I'm when I'm talking to Mitch, um, it's about ensuring that there's that partnership between his his team as they're working with certain synagogues that we're working in coordination together. So we're not you know separately going in and doing different things. And I think the MOU that uh, was announced today that we signed is going to allow for a lot of those kinds of of, uh, you know, it's really a buttress for us. It's to be able to, instead of us operating in separate silos, we can, we're doing different work. Our, our daily work is different. We're, we're training volunteers. Our volunteers are on the ground, on Shabbos, on, on the Hagim, protecting their institutions. What, what Mitch's team is doing is, is I feel, you know, they're almost opening it up for, for us and they're giving us a lot of extra um, information and in relationships and everything else that if we don't have that partnership, it makes it very difficult for us in the local, on the local level. And I think, you know, as we now sign the MOU, we're looking to do certain things like uh, develop, um, you know, a, a group of, of even non-Jewish uh, religious leaders that can come together that we can share best practices with, you know, because of Mitch's involvement with the JCRC, there's a lot of natural connectors there that we can, we can utilize that will help our volunteers on the ground. And I think what CSI is, is bringing to us on a daily basis is, is huge. And that's why we, we've done the MOU and why, why I think that, you know, we, we work so well together. And I think for the work with SCAN- yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a bit, of a, a bit of a journalist for a second and push back. Okay. Um, it's great that you're all working together, um, but it, let's, let's do a kind of 30 seconds. What does is, what is, uh, CSS do? You're in an elevator, you've got 30 seconds to tell me, go. We are the leading organization that trains Jewish volunteers to protect their Jewish institutions on a daily basis in the United States. Thanks. Michael, you're you on the same elevator. Off you go. <laughs> well, only just, this isn't cutting in my time, only two of us can fit in the elevator to be socially distant, so we're not- I got out. out. I got <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, we serve as the official safety and security organization for the organized community. That means developing best practice resources for physical security, critical infrastructure, training, operating the centralized intelligence information sharing capability and serving as the official liaison with federal law enforcement to support local federations, national partners and unserved as well as underserved communities. Thank you, Mitch. So the Community Security Initiative is the umbrella security organization for Greater New York. So that's Westchester, Nassau, Suffolk, and the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, we serve as uh, the organization that assesses security for institutions, provides guidance and advice, uh, provides training, provides intelligence, and serves as an emergency community systems network in case of an incident. Wow, you all stuck to under the time limit, which let me tell the audience, given the lengthy bios you submitted me in advance for your three line bio request, I'm impressed by. I was the fastest, Carly. I was the fastest. Um, so Michael, when <laughs> we first met, we, we bonded over the kind of the phrase that I often think, you know, should encapsulate security for the Jewish community, which is if you see something, say something. And, you know, it, it was an American phrase that, that made its way to the UK. And really, the Jews of the UK live by it, as do the rest of Europe. You know, you, you're on security in, on a Shabbat morning in London, and nine people have told you about the strange car they see outside, even though you know it's the car that you parked there two days earlier to act as a bollard. And, you know, everybody tells you if they see something that bothers you. My, my several experiences of synagogue in America, you know, I have a an unusual accent, nobody knows me, and nobody ever asks me who I am. 
So, um, you know, that mentality um, hasn't, hasn't reached the US shores yet. And whilst we're not encouraging um, an environment of fear, you know, we are encouraging an environment of proactivity. So how much of what needs to be focused on is an education campaign and the role the community themselves need to take it with regards to security? I, it's a great question. And um, I, I think that if we think about our 3000 year plus history as a people, we have survived and thrived by working together, coming together as a collective. Um, and we've made it through our, our own trials and tribulations by, by doing so. I think that's how we're gonna get through the current security situation uh, as well. When it comes to engagement, it's absolutely critical. We say, when you see something, say something, do something. This goes to the, the commentary that, that both Mitch and I offered earlier about the hate crimes reporting. Um, it goes to suspicious activity reporting. My 12 year old and my five year old have learned from an early age that their head is on a swivel. Uh, when they go into a store, Starbucks restaurant to look for those exits, we have to create that, but do it in a way that is not fear inducing, but that is in fact empowering. And that also recognizes that our community is not monolithic to go to a question that is in, in the chat, that we have great diversity in our community and that our organizations as community organizations invite everyone in. We invite the stranger. Uh, so how do we create programs, both training, infrastructure, physical security relationships that are respectful of Jewish values, but also create that sense of empowerment? We, we have more work to do on that. And, and part of that is the work of, of all of us uh, on, this, on this call or on this Zoom. Um, Mitch, Mitch's program, he's got done some phenomenal work in less than 10 months uh, that that program has been up and running. When I took this position in December 2017, only 7% of Jewish communities in the United States had a dedicated professional security director. Working with the FBI and DHS, modeling the Protective Security Advisor Program, we are now at 68% of Jewish communities, large, small, intermediate, as well as independent communities and national partners. But we have a lot more to do uh, to ensure that whether you're in Pittsburgh or Poway, that people are aware, they're trained, and that they commit to action. That when they see something, they do say something, and there's someone that they can say it to, that they are confident will then take action and deal with it, whether law enforcement or a professional or a volunteer who's well-trained that is coordinating, doing that coordination with law enforcement. Thank you, Michael. So Mitch, as you know, I have a bit of a, an obsession with doors. You know, when people ask me for advice on security, one of my first tips is close the door and have it that somebody can't push back against it. Now that sounds like a simple suggestion, but as we've seen time and time again, whether it was with the attack last year in Germany around the Jewish New Year, um, and we, we see it all the time across Europe, having a physical barrier and a door in place that isn't, isn't open all the time really makes a fundamental difference. Now, uh, Michael has just touched on the need to be a welcoming community, to be open to strangers. And that is a, that is a mindset shift, you know, that, that the door is closed and either you have somebody, if you have an extensive security volunteer team from CSS, or, you know, you have somebody on the other side of it who knows what to do when, when the door is knocked on. You know, part of what CSI has been doing over the last few months is really working with communities to help them prioritize what they need to do to make their buildings safe. At a time when funding is incredibly tight for these communities, they've had to you know, institute health policy they never anticipated. They don't get people through their doors so people aren't paying their synagogue fees. How are you helping people to make that decision with regards to how they spend their security dollars and, and how, they, how they can anticipate um, the needs ahead? Well, you know, in our catchment area, in the eight counties that we're responsible for, we estimate there to be 2,000 institutions. Uh, fortunately, the job is not only my own. Uh, we've got a fantastic team of five regional security managers, each one charged with being responsible for one or two counties, and a colleague, uh, David Pollack, who is the chair of our group uh, from the JCRC. So our group of seven are meeting with institutions now, you know, one-on-one -on -one and really doing an assessment based on the specific needs 
of that institution. Uh, just yesterday, I was walking through a JCC uh, in Manhattan and seeing how they are adjusting to the COVID situation, having a nursery school, and also thinking about how they were going to reopen. And the discussion was all about, do they have one entrance? Do they have two entrances? Do they need to change their security regime? Should they try some new technology um, that uh, we've heard about as being promising? And really, there's no substitute for those one-on-one -on -one in-person meetings uh, by our team as sort of a trusted advisor to help those institutions make those decisions. Uh, and those decisions are on multiple levels. You know, what do we need in the short term? If we win a grant from the federal government or from the state, that's great. Now, how do we spend those, fun those funds most efficiently? So there really is a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, hand-holding, uh, even if we're wearing masks and gloves uh, to get this done. Thank you. Um, so Evan, you know, d security does require, um, you know, you to be out and about. It does often require for you to see people's faces for you to be able to ask people questions. So how have you adapted the role of the volunteer in light of COVID? Well, I think it's it's about understanding the protocols around COVID and you know wearing masks and, and social distancing, but also still utilizing all the, the best practices that people are using in their trainings. And I think it's it's it is a different moment in time. One of the things that we're looking actually about adding uh, Carly is is, is something that Michael touched on um, about the, the welcoming, you know, aspect of, of being in shul, but yet having do doors and security is we have a situation now where um, Evan, you've gone on mute. Um, not sure if that was a technical problem on your end when the phone rang, but while you are unmuting yourself, I will, um, I will go over to Michael. Um, Michael, as you um, as you gear up for the opening and the high holidays, what are the the three tips that you're giving people um, as they look to to navigate the uh, the physical gap? I'm it's off now. Okay. Sorry, I don't well, know what happened. To you in a second. Um, as we uh, as we look to uh, to have people physically gathering, so not the not the Zoom gatherings, but the physical ones. So I and I I'm actually going to. Uh, De defer a bit to Mitch because frankly in his catchment area he has more uh, synagogues and shoals than anywhere else in in the country that are doing outdoor or uh, in-person socially distant services but but similar to him we we convened um, convened a webinar nationally to to address this issue number one thing that we always tell people commit to action uh, Whatever you're going to do, you need to be prepared to do it well and fully. So if you're having in-person services, make sure law enforcement is aware. If you've got a group like CSS that you're working with, get them through the building, and particularly if it's been some time since they've done that training or that engagement. Uh, and then make sure that you clearly earmark to the people that are attending the service as best you can um, what the expectations, the rules, the regulations, the policies and procedures are going to be so that people can do that that safely and securely. And um, I'll, I'll also just go back to, to your prior question for a second. You know, the most simple thing is like lock the door. Lock the door, but you can be safe and secure and uh, open and welcoming at the same time. I'll be happy to post in the chat a low cost, no cost security guidance uh, form that we put together working with all the security directors around the country, which hits a couple of those things that institutions can do right now with no cost. Thank you. Um, Evan, now that we've resolved your technical problem, sure. um, <laughs> you can continue your explanation on how volunteers are adjusting to safely secure during COVID. I think it's, it's listen, it's, it's very similar. To, I'm, I'm going to piggyback off what Michael said. I think it's, it's understanding the kind of the new rules of the game and understanding that right now we have synagogues that are meeting partially inside, partially outside. And the challenge is, is that these institutions, some are very far set back off roads, other are, others are on, on the corners. Uh, so the outsides, they were never trained or were never going to ever think to have services now, and you know that they were in the parking lot or, or in places on the property that they are now having services, especially with Hagim. So we're trying to get them uh, as much best practices as possible. We're, we're utilizing, again, uh, a lot of the, the things that we're getting from SCAN and from, from CSI and sharing those best practices. We also have our own experts on our own teams that are sharing those best practices about evaluation and, and ensuring that they're 
you know, still utilizing the, the laws of the land. We're, we're, we're a national organization and every state that we're in has different laws. Uh, every city has different protocols. So they need to understand those protocols and follow them. Uh, it's not universal by any stretch, but when it comes to the security components, it's, it's reevaluating what they, we've already known. I mean, they've been used to securing their institution in a particular way for, for many years and all of a sudden it's changed very rapidly. And if, and if you know, you have to adjust to that and utilize all of the, uh, the information that we're trying to provide and other organizations are, are able to provide and listen to that and not just try to do things rogue. And I think that's really critical for us with, with volunteers all over the country is that people are, are not just taking this burden on themselves, but they're actually utilizing the resources. And we're trying to, to impart that on them as much as possible. Thank you. So Mitch, I'm reliably informed that Rockland County um, has the largest Jewish population per capita of any US county with 31.4% of 90,000 residents being Jewish. So how is, um, is Rockland County being advised and is there a specific effort there to help them keep safe? You know, Rockland falls out of our official catchment area, but being a, neighbor, a neighboring county and being a county with so much connectivity to multiple elements of New York, it's always a county that you know we we consider you know an ally and an important neighbor. So if, if there's a particular issue, our regional security manager in, in Westchester uh, has has the guidance that he is to make himself available, uh, you know when possible to institutions there. And you know when things have happened in Rockland County, whether it be the horrific Munsey attack of last year, uh, certainly you know people from JCRC New York were quick to respond, uh, you know to that situation. So you know, in short, though not officially part of our uh, area, you know we consider it a neighbor, and there are certain things you do with neighbors, and you try and treat them well and help them out if you can. So uh, I would I would I would lay it out that way. Thank you. So for those from Rockland County who, who would like uh, advice or guidance from Michael or Mitch or Evan, um, I'm sure JFN would be very happy to, to connect. Um, so one of the things that we've seen over the last um, couple of months is, is some increased tensions between the Black and Jewish communities, particularly related to you know, the, the Black Lives Matter organizations and recent anti-Semitic statements by black sports and entertainment personalities like Deshaun Jackson of the Eagles, but also you know, the, the general um, challenges around the, the role of law enforcement and perhaps how notably Jews of color may feel with the need for increased presence and visibility of law enforcement. So these are very sensitive and challenging things to navigate. Evan, I know you have um, a lot of experience, you know, bridging the gap between both communities. So I was hoping that you could touch on some of your, your ADL experience to comment on that. Well, I think it's, it's, it's been a difficult time. And I think, you know, what was challenging for me is, as I spent, as you just said, so much of my time working with uh, the black community and other communities of color uh, during this rise of anti-Semitism that we've seen over the last five years and, and trying to stand with those communities as, they, as they've experienced uh, unbelievable hatred and, and, and experiences of their own uh, that, that replicated a lot of what Jews are going through and sometimes even obviously even worse. I think what was hard is again uh, is, is in January we saw this tremendous coming together uh, of so many different groups after the horrific acts that took place in the New York area in December and I hate it's been hard for me uh, that through COVID I and, and then the, the obviously what's gone on um, in our country with, with, with what's happened in the black community and the, and the resurgence of, of Black Lives Matter because of these horrific incidents and, and the, you know, ending racism and, and, this, and these new efforts. What I think has been challenging is that there has still been acts of anti-Semitism and certainly horrific things that have been said, whether it was from the, the head of the NAACP in Philadelphia or from some you know, stars or, or athletes. And I think what was concerning for me, what was hard for me, um, was I did not see the, the response, the emphatic response that I was hoping to see from those communities when those things happened. And that was disappointing to me because I think, you know, we, 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 we built up so much of each other you know, working, you know, whether it's around gun violence uh, or, or, or basic racism, 
uh, and, and, they, and them standing with us, those groups standing with us around anti-Semitism and, and the murderous acts that have taken place on American soil towards Jews. But I just wish that we, we didn't have to wait to or ask for when there were such overt acts of anti-Semitism from such prominent individuals. Um, because I think it normalizes a lot of it. When, when other people in those communities that idolize these people, and these are leaders in the community, it normalizes anti-Semitism. It allows it to metastasize. It allows it for it to grow online and for people to ultimately act out. So I think that's been uh, a real challenge. Uh, on the piece of uh, you know, Jews of color, it, it's certainly been uh, something that I've been aware of, you know, even when my time at ADL and been even more aware of at CSS as we are you know, trying to welcome in individuals. And sometimes people, it's been well documented, Jews of color feel that sometimes they are not welcome into uh, into or you know, into synagogues, uh, Orthodox or former conservative, because they don't look the part. They don't. They're not Ashkenaz. They don't look like they're from Europe. And one of the things that we're implementing at CSS is a whole new training component for our volunteers, uh, with the help of Rabbi Bob Kaplan and the JCRC, uh, that they're going to be helping our, our our volunteers get trained on understanding Jews of color, being inclusive uh, with that community and others, even though we still have to maintain a level of security and a level of, of protection for institutions, but it can't be at the expense of, of, of individuals that, that are members of our community just because they look differently uh, than we do. So I think it is, it's an incredibly challenging time, Carly, and I think that we have to figure it out. But of, what, of what's happened late is I've honestly been, I've been disappointed uh, by, the, by the response uh, by, by these leaders. And it wasn't as emphatic and as fast as I would want it to be. And I think I've heard that from other Jewish leaders as well. Thank you. So, Mitch, one of the concerns for a lot of people um, is, is going to be some of the, the turmoil in New York City, um, particularly with City Hall and the NYPD. Um, do you see the NYPD as still being able to protect the Jewish community in the run-up to the High Holy Days, um, as we would hope? Yeah, I can understand why that's a concern. Um, just this past week, the NYPD had their annual High Holiday Briefing. And that comes on the heels of a lot of direct one-on-one -on -one interactions we've had with the NYPD. And in spite of everything that's been going on the last few months, it was very reassuring to hear that they're continuing to devote uh, significant resources to securing the high holidays in, in New York City, and also now aware that in fact, many institutions will be holding their services outdoors and being apprised of the new uh, safeguards that they'll need to put in place, uh, need to protect those, uh, those services. They're very amenable to doing whatever needs to be done, as long as they're made of aware ahead of time. And our team has been on that. So feeling good about that. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're back in our elevator again. Um, and as this is the Jewish Funders Network, if you each had one initiative that you would put forwards that you think is, it needs funding for the year ahead, what would it be? So Michael, I'm going to start with you, and you've uh, you've got a couple of floors of the elevator ride. I'm not going to suggest to presume to suggest to tell this group what to fund. What I'd like to emphasize is how I think we should undertake funding when it comes to safety and security. As a Jewish people, it's not enough if one community has adequate security, but one is lacking. If one synagogue is protected, but another is exposed. When attack happens anywhere in the United States or frankly around the world, we all feel it. And that's why we're pushing to build a collective collaborative system. A siloed approach to security makes us less safe. And on this week, we can remember that a siloed approach is what brought us September 11th. While the enemy is, was diligent, the intelligence and collaboration failure was our own. I would encourage the use of resources as funders to push us as professionals to require us to work together for the overall benefit of the community to create that security shield across the entire United States and North America. Thank you. Evan? No, I think it's what, what Michael said is correct. I think we're all, we're all bringing very unique uh, components uh, to the overall issue of, of communal security. And I think, you know, we all need to be funded at, at levels that are high enough to, for us to provide, you know, the gold standard kind of service to, our, to, to the Jewish community that needs it more and more, especially as the climate is, is changing. I think, you know, for us at CSS, it's critical that we get into more synagogues. Uh, we've been around since 2007, and we, we've done a tremendous job, uh, but we're right now at 100 synagogues across the country. We need to be in thousands of synagogues around the country, and I think we can do that through the help of 
of CSI in, through SCAN and the work that they're already doing in synagogues, but we need to be uh, organizationally getting tens of thousands of volunteers uh, engaged and empowered in the Jewish community to protect their institutions. And we need to be able to, to expand uh, rapidly uh, and not just be uh, you know, in, in, a, in these handful of shuls and pockets of the American Jewish landscape. We need to be something that's national in, 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 in which we are, but, but expansive in a way that we have not been yet and we, we need to be. Thank you. And uh, Mitch? Well, since my two colleagues have a, a little been a little bit shy to mention two initiatives, I'll be the, the New Yorker in the group and, and just lay it out there. Although both of these initiatives that we can share. Uh, the first is, as we like to say in the counterterrorism world, is be left of boom. So have the ability to gather intelligence to identify a Robert Bowers who committed the Pittsburgh atrocity or the John Ernst who committed the Poway attack. So having intelligence analysts uh, using platforms that enable us to identify these people in the deep and the dark web in Gab and 4chan so that we can pass that on to law enforcement to help enable them to arrest these people before they commit their attacks. So intelligence analysts, number one, and we commit to share that intelligence with uh, my colleagues here on the phone, on the Zoom. And the second is a security assessment app. Um, you may not know, but the Department of Homeland Security provided $90 million last year in grants to nonprofits. However, in order to win the grant, you had to fill out a painstaking application process that was informed by a physical security assessment that has to be done very manually. We are currently piloting an app that you could use on an iPad that would make this done uniformly and the output could flow right into that, um, that application. Here in New York, we had 138 institutions win 12, more, almost $13 million in grants. Uh, we'd love to get this app up and running. It's something that we could share across the country through SCAN so that other institutions who are trying to win these federal grants, and we would have a version of this for state grants specific to New York, but potentially customizable for other states as well. So those are two initiatives that are really uh, at the top of our list. Thank you, Mitch. So um, since I'm very keen to end almost on time, um, all that leaves me to do is to thank you all very much um, to suggest that if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, um, you can sign up to CSS. Um, M Michael Masters has posted very helpfully a link in the chat to their material. And I really encourage you to look at the SCAN website um, because a lot of the, the material and the best practices are there for you and for you to share with your communities. And finally, for Mitch, um, you know, as, as CSI really gathers pace, it's, it's very important that for those of you in the New York area, um, that we, um, we can look to, to support CSI and help it become a, a model for across the, um, across the, the US. So um, I wish you all a very safe um, and secure um, High Holy Days. And to all of you on the phone who I know will be giving up your High Holy Days to keep the Jewish community of America safe, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much to Tamar and JFN for organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Evan and Michael and Mitch for your presentations and more importantly for the work that you do every day to protect, um, to protect our community and our institutions. I wanna wish everybody a happy and safe um, new year. And I look forward to learning and joining with all of you again in the future soon. Thank you all, have a good afternoon.